all you can do is put it up a little bit more. And again, we've seen my face several times these three days. Woo! So okay. Yay! Um, and if we talk <laughs> different people in these days and in recent years, um, I wanted to ask maybe three questions that might seem a bit stupid or strange to you, but who of you is involved in archiving, like not, not, not like institutional, where the job is like we are there to preserve stuff? Okay, who of you can continue their work, their daily work, or other way around? Who of you can actually pack their stuff and go home if the computers don't work? Who of you can actually continue some of the work if the computers don't work? Yeah, that's good. That's good. But it doesn't seem like the majority. Who of you in a, who work in institutions have people that actually are responsible for knowing computer stuff? Um, how big is the overlap of these beings, usually called IT guys, but most people that I know? And you can actually talk with them about your archiving needs. Yeah, 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 yeah. How, how big is the overlap? No, okay, okay. okay. Um, <laughs> that was an evil question. Like, how big is the overlap? <laughs> okay, but well, what I'm trying to get at is that um, when I ask people, like, okay, where's the person I can speak with that is able to exchange on a certain professional level, speaking about things that your work is depending on, I very often get the answer, like, Okay, we have the IT guys, but they only say that they set up our computers on the network. And then sometimes we catch them that they kind of like do things where like the, they don't care about resolution, they don't care about aspect ratio, they don't even care about like, oh, but JPEG is way smaller, or why don't you do like lossy H264? I can do it on my computer back home. What is wrong with you? Why are you doing all this? So, who of you has experienced? something like this that your IT guys don't necessarily care or understand the archive rules. I will raise my hand. Okay. That was just an input for me. <laughs> I will not tell you what I'm doing with it. Uh, but it's actually really tricky to work in that situation. At least I find it tricky because if I ask, like, okay, who can I speak to? And then, like, there is no one, or they're not responsible, or they don't feel responsible. That's something I think that should be changed. Okay, I'd like to have a few more minutes. I will not waste too much of your time. What we've seen so far is Kieran was fuzzing files. He was actually testing uh, how well does the stuff behave when you come with broken input. What I did, it was not randomly, what I did was taking a set of test files, different test files that I could get that are publicly available as reference files, to put it in with different properties and parameters for FF31 encoding while the development of version 2 and version 3 was going on because Michael Niedermeyer said he needs feedback on how stuff behaves. Now, the collection for input videos that are available for everybody else to reproduce test results, it was very important for me because otherwise I could just put in videos, claim anything, and nobody could actually reproduce my results. It would be good for me if I want to hide stuff, but actually I wanted to, to be able to reproduce the results. Now what I found out was it's not that easy to actually get a real variety of different formats with different properties to actually test stuff like from 8-bit per component to 16-bit per component in Bayou B color space and RGB and subsampling and so on and so on. Of course, it can generate these files, but they behave slightly differently in terms of compression and other stuff when they are synthetically generated. I found out there's not a lot of stuff that you actually get under a license that you can reuse. Now, 
think it's kind of live. Um, there is this, that's the actual, it's just a forum that a friend of mine and I have set up, and he and I, we post a lot in there. And um, so there's like this guy called Rooker, and then there's this Peter B guy. And I put together some links about test videos. So there's the Durst collection, and so on and so on. And then I was looking for like professional stuff with 10 bit or film sorts or something. And I found some from the Swedish television that was really good. And there is a note about the European Broadcasting Union files. I don't know if they changed it yet, but they are actually not freely available for anyone else to reproduce, just for EBU members or for quite a costly amount of money. So I was not too happy with this. So what I stuck to at the beginning, what I stuck with at the beginning was this third collection. So you see, there's a lot of videos with quite old content and really weird people on there. No, they're not weird, it's just like the 80s and the hairstyle and everything. Uh, so some videos, and they were used for MPIC and lossy encoding tests for, I don't know, 20 plus years. Uh, and now uh, down there, there are some videos which are actually HD and beyond. You have now, ooh, they weren't there when I used them, like computer generated uh, graphics and other stuff. So you see, it's quite a list of videos. What I did was I sorted them by resolution of the original video. Uh, these letters are the definition of resolution in a certain speak, it's like quarter sif. CIF, and this is like a certain resolution that was used for sub-standard definition resolution for real-time transmission or encoding in times where video on a computer was really a hard task. So some of these videos here, the early ones, you see they have like 44 megabyte, and we're speaking about uncompressed 44 megabyte. The, the, the resolution is cute, considering nowadays resolutions. So, let's take a look at what I did. What I did was, I wrote a program that calls FFmpeg, goes through these videos in a folder, and then produces different outcomes, like different, uses different parameters for encoding it in FFP1, because for version one, you only had four variations. You had two parameters, Coda and context. Both could be either zero or one. So you have four possible permutations. That's nice. With version three, you had slice COC yes and no, which is doubles it. It's just a bit. And now you have slice numbers from four to thirty something. Long story short, I had like one input file, two hundred something output files. And I did this number crunching on my computer at home, similar to what Kieran said. He said, yeah, the computer was standing there and had computing power over, so he just left it running over the weekend. I did this for weeks and months, and every time I stumbled over something, I had to reset it and run the tests again. So this was running for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and days and days and days, and now I ended up with a lot of numbers. So for this list of videos multiplied by 260, and I only narrowed down the permutation combinations because they would have been way more if I had a complete set. Because I had to do YV, some RGB, <coughs> some subsampling variations. So here you see, um, is it big enough? I have to show you the yeah, something like that. Okay. Um, Here's, here's the file names, and that's just standard definition. You see the 640, 480, and here's some PAL resolution as well, and some is NTSC. <coughs> now, oh, you miss out on all the colors. Um, here is actually a slight green. Maybe I find some with a better green, because you don't really see it that well here. Oh, that's really great. I want to have better green. Oh. Yeah, okay. No. okay, now, 
this table is really, really confusing. But I didn't come up with a better way of putting all these numbers in some readable form. So you have SFP1 version 1, four variations, like coda 0, context 0, coda 0, context 1, coda 1, context 0, coda 1, context 1. That's like all these weird numbers. Then you have version 3. <coughs> then you've got four slices with permutations of coder and um, slice here, C on, and pass 1 and pass 2, 30 slices. You don't have to remember this. It's just like so that you see, I only picked out a small subset of parameter variations. What I was getting at is, is there a difference between a GOP size of 1? Like each frame decodes by itself, or if I do an interframe, because f one can also do this, but we don't want to do it for archiving. If I have a GOP of 300 pictures, is there any compression difference? And the greener it is, the bigger the difference. So this is like really green, so using one frame as like only encode every frame or 300 depending on each other is 31% difference, for example. Now, the size difference here. That might be more interesting for you. This is how well it compresses compared to uncompressed. So what I did was I calculated the uncompressed size of the input video, then I compressed it, and then I did a simple subtraction and say, okay, how well is the compression here, for example, it compresses up to 30%, which means it's only a third that is left. The rest is like half, 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 most of it is like half, and I found something very interesting. It should be in HD and beyond. 90%. I was like, what the hell is this? It compresses down that only 10% uh, like even at the tenth of the size, only like there's got to be something wrong. Mm. Actually, you see a lot of over 70%, 80% something. Um, this is for computer-generated content. Like, Sintel is an open movie movie that was rendered with open source program Blender. So it's a computer-generated movie. And all these computer-generated movies are so clean because of the lack of noise that they compress, they have to be like a tenth of the original source. It was really like, hey, yay, so if we would be working with computer-generated movies, that would be awesome, but they probably will only make that attraction. Or in the future, when they get rid of all these movie stars because of their attitudes and their costs, maybe we will have more archiving content that compresses down to 10%. So, if, Somebody asks you, but has anyone tested FFV1 with different resolutions and different input files? As you, see. Uh, as you see, this is just HD and beyond, and uh, the others are split here. So you get a few hundred here, a few hundred, some here, some here, some here, and then had even a media peak connection where we took three files um, and even put two of them no, all three of them actually. I put them on a server so people could reproduce these because I wanted to have files with material that we actually had from the archive, like from the Digibeta or from the HS, because I couldn't find anything of this online. So I only took two publicly because of the rights issues. I ran other tests, but I could not publish them because you'd not be allowed to have these files. But at the media take, there are enough files that we could do testing. So far, so good. That was um, a short look into the work done in order to be able to say, yes, FFP 1.3 can be released, and we're pretty serious that it can encode and decode properly. Oh yeah, by the way, with all these files, I used frame 5 to validate that what goes in losslessly comes out. Um, so every single uh, file you see here it was not only tested for performance, but also that the encoder really is bit exact process. Any questions or comments so far? Yes. Uh, 
this GLP feature generally is not recommended for <coughs> archiving. Mm -hmm. So why did you use so much time? Because Niedermeyer requested it, because he wanted to know certain behaviors of the, the codec, where I can only say that I don't know too much about the algorithms and internals used, but he said, please give me numbers for how the behavior is between these GOT1 and 300. But a uh, nice side effect from this is that here is something with P1 and P2. It means first pass and second pass. So there is the possibility to encode a file and have the encoder take notes while looking at the file and then encode it again using these notes so it knows what to expect. And then it can actually compress it better. It takes twice the time to do this, but um, and it's really difficult to read. Uh, if we have, I showed before, here we have 30% gain in what GOP size 1 or GOP size 300. Like 30% is pretty nice. Okay, um, if it were two pass mode, we gain almost the same compression as using a GOP size of 300 with a GOP size of 1. <coughs> that means that there is even greater potential for more compression if using multipass mode. It's not working properly at the moment, but we've seen in these tests that this might be something to go for if somebody wants to like, do their collection and they have enough time to do a multipass encoding. It might even be possible that the encoder takes note during the capture if the capture application supports it. And that was like a, yeah, we, we had to do tests and find out how this stuff actually behaves in order to know stuff. Does that answer the question? Yes. Anything else? What do you mean it does not work well the two pass? The two pass? Yeah. It what crashes the file. The, 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 pass, the, the, the pass log file is written as text with numbers. And it gets so incredibly huge for very short files. And I'm speaking about seriously short files. If you try to, to pass a 10 minute file, uh, it doesn't work. It worked with these short clips because they were only a few frames because they were uncompressed as source. And so here, it worked properly. But when you do it with a file that is a few minutes long, the pass log file becomes several hundred megabytes of text to be parsed, and that crashes the FFmpeg encoding. So it's not ready for production with exactly. one hour videos. Or exactly. Video so this was like, okay, that's something it can be worked on if necessary or required, but we got an, a lookout on what to expect in terms of compression gain. I see. Anyone else? Well then, thank you, and we shall continue with other things.